Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Vlad Kindratenko. Uh, I'm one of the co-directors of the Center for Artificial Intelligence Innovation. So we would like to welcome you to the, our whole uh, seminar series dedicated to applications of uh, AI. And today, uh, we are very pleased to uh, introduce uh, or to present Rohit Harwawa, uh, who is a founder, professor of engineering and the director of the uh, Cancer Center at the University of Illinois. And he will be presenting today about uh, the chemical imaging for an expanded view of the pathologic basis of disease, uh, a challenge for AI. Uh, uh, Rohit is um, uh, primarily, he's primarily appointment in the Department of Bioengineering. However, he uh, also has numerous appointments in other departments, including the uh, School of Chemistry. He graduated with a dual degree uh, from the Indian Institute of Technology in New Delhi and received his doctorate degree from the Case Western Research University in 2000. Uh, he actually spent several years at the National Science, uh, the National Institute of Health, uh, and then he became uh, a faculty at the University of Illinois in 2005, and been in, in here, has been here ever since. He's widely recognized for his research on chemical imaging and advances in theory, instrumentation, and applications in cancer pathology. His group, in particular, aims to recognize and subtype cancer by its underlying molecular characteristics using advanced chemical imaging and also applying modern machine learning. And the ultimate goal of all this work is, of course, to allow a better treatment of patients. So we're very pleased to have Rohit uh, today. Um, and Rohit, uh, uh, welcome. Ah, thank you, Vlad. So I, I thought we'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit today about some of the, the challenges uh, that we face that are particularly related to AI and really wanted to give the community here an introduction to the sort of work that we do uh, and see if there are opportunities uh, mostly for collaboration and, and how we can move this entire field forward in, in many ways. So please feel free to, to interrupt me or, or type a, a comment and then we can uh, move this along. But I hope the main purpose today is to mainly uh, expose you a little bit to the technology and, and think about uh, some interesting ideas in AI that we can pursue together. So the, uh, at the end of the uh, work, what we are essentially aiming to do is uh, the kind of figure that you see here. Uh, this is an image of a fingerprint. Uh, it's a well-recognized uh, uniform form of evidence that you would see for many uh, perpetrators for many, many different kinds of things. The interesting part about this image is that it is made without using any external agents. So normally, you know, they would throw black powder and use a tape to lift off things. What we've done here is we've introduced light. So light onto the sample, reflected light is measured back. And some of that light is sensitive to the oils in your hands. So by looking at the absorption of light that is sensitive to the oils in your hands, we can plot it quantitatively in the blue color. And so wherever you see blue, there's a substantial presence of oil. You can also see little specks of green, and those are uh, specks of your skin. So those are protein-rich materials that form the cell walls of your skin, for example, that fall off every time you touch something. And then you see some elements of red there, and those, those particles of red should not actually be there. Those are a trinitro compound, which is a composition of an explosive. So here we can see that this person who handled that explosive material uh, made this fingerprint. And we can also see further evidence, like you will see all the red particles are in between the ridges. They're not actually on top of the ridge. So when you press down uh, on a surface, anything that's on your ridge probably gets pushed into the, the middle part. So that's why you see a lot of the, the red particles sort of inter-ridge particles there. If we were to look at this evidence in detail, uh, we actually would still detect particles using this technology, which is somewhat old now, uh, up to about 50 touches of surfaces after the person has handled the RDX. So it's a very sensitive uh, technology to not only look at the chemistry of what you have or the chemistry of the evidence, but also look at the spatial dependence of that evidence. And the spatial spectral property actually is really the key to making decisions in this case. So in this case, it's pretty understandable. Uh, we can take the fingerprint image and run it against the database. And now you can figure out who actually made the print. And of course, you can take the full spectral data of each of the red or green points 
And you can run that against a, a spectral database and you can figure out what that compound is that it might be in there uh, in this particular fingerprint. So how does this relate to cancer? Well, uh, if you think about cancer, what we do today is an image like this. So we take the tissue out of the body, uh, we slice it thin, we put it on a glass slide, we add some dyes on it. And this is a dye combination in particular called the hematoxylin and eosin combination. Uh, and it ends up staining all the protein rich regions in the tissue pink and all the nucleic acid rich regions blue. So you will see this pink and blue two color uh, sort of image. The reason we do that is because human tissue natively does not have any contrast. It's, uh, it's fairly transparent to visible light. So we have to add dyes on it. Uh, so we need the dyes. Uh, somebody needs to look at this dyed image and essentially do what you see here is, is put a, a felt tip marker and mark out where there's cancer and where there's normal tissue. Um, the, the molecular specificity of this is not particularly high because we're just looking at proteins or nucleic acids. Uh, of course, there are some dyes that are very, very specific to a particular molecule, but uh, you know, broadly getting molecular specificity is, is difficult uh, in this case. Uh, multiplexing for different kinds of molecular specificity is difficult uh, because you can only add so many dyes into the visible region. And of course, multimodal imaging is difficult because now you've, you've changed the material. You've added some dyes to it. So you have to have the next modality come in, which is not sensitive to these dyes, uh, and then use that. Uh, finally, one needs to go to, the, uh, to med school to make sense of this image. Uh, people like uh, engineers and AI scientists cannot sit here and, uh, and make sense of this. And what we are instead proposing to do uh, is actually an image that looks like this. So in the middle is an information about what cell type there is. The reason this is so important is that only uh, a few cell types lead to cancers arising in a particular tissue. So this is uh, in particular prostate tissue. And we are, uh, most of prostate tissues arise in epithelial cells. So we are in the middle image looking at epithelial cells and saying, this is where the tissue begins. And all the other cells we just collectively label as stroma. And those are cells we don't care about for the time being. So what we're doing now is turning the image in the middle to the image on the right, in which we have uh, sort of zeroed out the stromal pixels because that's not where the cancer begins. And we have now looked at the chemical properties of the epithelial cells. And we're trying to point out uh, whether this is a certain kind of cancer or not. So this particular approach we'll talk about quite a bit today, uh, but it doesn't need dyes. It needs what we call spectroscopic imaging. And I'll explain this in a second. Uh, there are no manual decisions in this because you cannot go and look at the chemistry pixel by pixel. So you do need AI uh, approaches to help you here. Uh, spectroscopically, we can measure many species uh, of chemistry. So we have multiple species uh, sensitivity here. We can measure broad classes of molecules like proteins, DNA, uh, different kinds of nucleic acids, uh, carbohydrates, lipids, and so on. Uh, this is a non-destructive technique. We don't need any dyes. We're only using light and we're using artificial intelligence algorithms. So the advantage is that you can do this uh, type of technology or you can deploy this before you do the traditional uh, destructive techniques that are in the clinic. And finally, you don't need to be a pathologist or even an AI specialist. Once the algorithm is made, then you just need to figure out how you're visualizing these things uh, and maybe the visualization in different contexts uh, can be different. So you just need to understand how things are visualized, which as you can see here is really simple. Uh, we're visualizing the cancer here, for example, in the right image. So we're really taking pathology from this opaque science and trying to expand its user base, uh, first of all, by doing this. Uh, we're trying to take pathology from a manual uh, decision-making process in which there's subjectivity and in which there is low throughput to an artificial intelligence-based uh, uh, practice in which throughput can be high and you can have objective predictors. We're trying to expand pathology from needing dyes and stains to actually measuring multiple chemical specificity with spectroscopic imaging. So that's the theme of the, uh, the discussion today as to how we're really thinking about expanding pathology. And I'll give you more details on each one of these aspects in the, uh, in the few slides next. So let's start by looking at how we're expanding it by developing spectroscopic imaging. Uh, the idea again at the end being that we want to be label free, we want to be molecularly rich, and we want to make this whole process digital. So it's an all digital molecular process. 
Uh, here, just to recap, is how uh, pathology is done today. You take an unstained biopsy sample, stain it, do microscopy, you get an image that looks something like this. Uh, then the pathologist comes into the picture and they perform a manual diagnosis uh, and uh, perhaps provide some information that might be related uh, to, to prognosis in the patient. Uh, a revolution is sort of brewing and because of AI. And what people are doing is taking the exact same image and now putting in AI algorithms to interpret this image, right? And then say, okay, anything the pathologist can do, we can do digitally now. And that's great, except the information content really hasn't changed. We're still using the same uh, image that we were using previously, and we're just making it all digital now. So instead of a, a person looking at it, uh, you can use an AI algorithm. What my lab is interested in doing is taking the unstained tissue onto a new technology, and we're gonna talk about this technology uh, a little bit, but essentially it's combining a spectrometer, which is the thing you see on the left uh, with a microscope and a computer to run your AI algorithms. Uh, the data, instead of looking at an RGB image uh, at every pixel, the data here is a little bit more complicated. And at every pixel, we have 2000 data points uh, instead of three data points. So the data set uh, is maybe about 500 to 1000 times larger and that obviously creates some challenges in managing the data, uh, in storing it, moving it, and analyzing it. But what we're trying to do uh, is two things. One is a technology that we have developed in the lab that we call stainless staining, and actually uh, the University of Illinois owns the patent to it. The idea is to take uh, spectral data and turn it into an image that is looked at by the pathologist. So what we're doing here is we're avoiding the whole staining microscopy um, uh, step and instead going straight from uh, the unstained biopsy into a stained image uh, using a computer program. Uh, the second thing we can do with AI is add more information. So expand the palette of information that we're getting and actually add some new information. So here's the outcome of that new information. Once again, as I showed you on the previous slide, we're, we're interested in finding epithelium in stroma, but in this case, it's a, it's a piece of breast tissue. So on the left in these two image sets, you see epithelium and stroma. And on the right, you see actually different kinds of diseases. Maybe it's benign in certain parts of the tissue. Uh, maybe it has uh, ductal carcinoma in situ or other uh, kinds of diseases. So what we can do to the pathologist now is provide them this informative image that is color coded and provide them the traditional image uh, that they're used to seeing. And then they can make perhaps better decisions. Uh, of course, the AI, uh, algorithm can also help them uh, inform them and make good decisions uh, that maybe exceed their, their cognition. So let's take a look at how this technology is actually going to be used, and I'll give you some examples. Uh, then I'll turn to some of the technology challenges and tell you a little bit about how we're addressing those and how we're getting ready uh, for some really advanced AI uh, algorithm applications. So where we see this technology being used is actually a fourfold space. Uh, the first one is to just become more efficient. So if you look at uh, prostate biopsies, for example, about 30% of biopsies don't have enough material uh, of a certain type, namely epithelial cells, to actually make a decision. So if you deployed this technology, very quickly you could see that, oh, these 30% of samples uh, are not worth looking at, so we won't look at them. Uh, the second place where we see deploying this technology is in a human assistive technology where we prevent errors that currently happen uh, today because of omission uh, or maybe because of pressures of time or, or so on. So you can have something that quality controls for diagnoses. And obviously this is a little bit more difficult uh, than simply looking at the quality assurance uh, of the sample in the first example. The third one is even a more difficult uh, situation. So in the third case, what we are trying to address is the difference in pathologists' opinion about the severity of disease. So what we want to get to is a more objective um, configuration, a more objective diagnosis using AI, as opposed to some subjectivity that it does exist in current manual approaches. And finally, we think where AI can really impact things is providing outcomes, right? At the time of diagnosis, telling a patient how their tumor is going to behave under different conditions. And this is obviously, you can imagine, this is really, really difficult to do. Uh, and there is no, there are really no good examples of this happening anywhere. So we think this is perhaps uh, the place where AI can play the biggest role. So as opposed to going through all the four cases, let me actually focus on the last case uh, on the prognosis problem and give you a couple of examples 
on how AI can perhaps make a difference. And then I'll also tell you where the gaps are uh, in those examples. So we think, uh, at least in our philosophy, we cannot use AI with just the traditional uh, approaches. We cannot take traditional pathology images and just turn them over to AI and hope for a revolution. We actually have to utilize AI along with some novel concepts. So in particular, one concept that we think is, is really novel and could is ripe for, for use by AI is the following. So cancer traditionally has been thought of as a collection of cancer cells, right? Uh, it's just one type of cells that just grow uncontrollably and result in a tumor. That's actually not the full picture. The full picture is that cancer is a society of cells. It's not just cancer cells, but it's also the extracellular matrix that changes. It's the immune cells that come into the picture. It's the blood vessels that, that help drive cancer growth uh, and so on. But the problem was, how do you measure all these, right? So if you were to measure these with molecular probes, by the time you're finished staining for epithelial cells, for example, there's no room uh, to stain for anything else. So you've got to stain for other things and it's a, it's a long cumbersome process. But of course, with spectroscopic imaging, you can measure every single pixel to the same degree of certainty and you can use the spectroscopy now to tell you a few things. So that's where the AI comes in. Of course, we, we used the IR microscope. We we're able to measure things and then we had to use AI to analyze things. And this is again published in the scientific reports paper. So if you're interested, you can look up the details. Uh, but here we used a frequent pattern mining idea. And what we did was took out some of the variability in biological uh, situations by actually binning the data. So we had categorical data and then we use frequent pattern mining on that data, much like you use in natural language processing and try to figure out the patterns that would tell us if this is a dangerous cancer or not. And lo and behold, what we found was that the patterns we found were mostly in the microenvironment and actually in the epithelial cells, our patterns were no better uh, than what we can do in the clinic already. So looking at epithelial patterns of chemistry did not give us uh, any more information, but looking at the microenvironment gave us a lot of information. And then we were able to put that into a predictor. So at the end of the day, what we want to do is divide people into groups. And we thought here we would divide people into quartiles. So this is a study based on 256 patients. And we try to divide them into highest risk, which is uh, quartile number four, uh, with medium risk, which is quartile number three and two, and with low risk, which is quartile number one. And again, we, we had low risk all set at a risk factor of one. And you can see that the IR method, which is our method here, uh, compares rather well to the two clinical methods that, were, that we compared against in this study, uh, in which the risk prediction was not as robust and perhaps did not give as much separation. So what we are able to do is predict risk with a higher degree of certainty and with a higher uh, perhaps insight into the disease. So we've extended this concept further and taken this to colon cancer. And here we looked at about 800 patients data. And what we were able to show was that we can actually explicitly look at the microenvironment. And again, these are um, a logistic regression model that we used here because we were interested in interpreting the data uh, more so than extracting uh, the best results out of it. Uh, but now with, when we can interpret the data and we can show precisely how the microenvironment contributes uh, to the disease diagnosis or the disease prognosis, uh, we find out that we can actually separate colon cancer into two different groups. Uh, one is a low risk group, the other is a high risk group, and we can now find them rather easily. But the problem is we're only using the spectral data here of the colon cancer. We're not actually using the spatial distribution uh, of this data. And also we're not using any spatial spectral correlations uh, in this data. So what we are able to do is somewhat less powerful than perhaps the state of the art AI algorithms. But the reason we wanted to do this was we wanted to make sure that we can interpret those changes first before we went to uh, deep learning, for example. But again, you'll recognize that deep learning uh, with this kind of, of data would be very, very powerful uh, because of the extensive spectral as well as spatial data. And now we have a baseline performance uh, that is not deep learning, but still works uh, in, in sort of traditional machine learning. And now we can transition this to more powerful AI algorithms. So one of the challenges we're facing also is the quality of data, uh, both the spatial quality and the spectral quality. And before we start thinking about deep learning, for example, 
Uh, let's take a look at exactly what the quality is and how we can perhaps uh, give some really high quality data for deep learning. So here's the problem. Uh, this is some data from a few years ago. And on the left, the stained image, you can see this is the tra traditional h and &E stain. And on the right, the black and white image is uh, the infrared image that I have uh, pulled out precisely. And in this image, uh, what you're seeing is a, lot, a lack of spatial detail. So on the, on the h and &E, you can see the nuclei, for example, are, are little dark blue objects. And on the IR image, you don't see them as clearly. And there are two reasons for this. One is you need to collect now with the IR data, uh, maybe 500 times more data. So you obviously cannot collect it uh, with the same quality. Uh, the second is that the wavelengths in IR are much longer than in the visible. So the dogma was that, of course, you're going to lose quality uh, because the, uh, the wavelength just simply doesn't allow you the same quality. So we, we started asking this question that do we really understand the physics of this process first? So we're not going to use a, an AI algorithm. I'm, I'm very aware uh, that we can use a deep learning algorithm, for example, to to do style transfer or something like that between these two images. But uh, what we decided to do back uh, a few years ago was ask some fundamental questions on can IR image quality actually be improved to match that of optical microscopy. And to do that, what we did was we turned to physics and we now have a really explicit model for how the IR microscope measures data. And using this model, what we were able to put in were or values uh, for different parameters and make some simulations that allowed us to predict what the ideal microscope could be. But I just want to leave you with the thought that this is a physics-based process and we can actually match the physics to put constraints on any AI algorithm or to, or to enhance the AI algorithm in such a way that you're physics-based now and you can actually uh, make some sense of the data. So one of the, the ways in which we made sense of the data was we actually predicted uh, what, the, what the pixel size should be that is optimal uh, when we want to make these measurements. And this was a little bit surprising. Uh, this went against the dogma. And if you're interested in physics, uh, I can have a separate uh, discussion here. But I just want to tell you about what happens uh, to actually the data. So on the left, you see things that were uh, state of the art uh, commercially at that time. And on the right, you see this newly designed based on our theory microscope. So we published this and we've of course moved the technology forward in our lab and I'll explain how uh, in a few minutes, but you can see again, left and right, this is what uh, we've been able to do in our lab. Uh, and essentially what has happened in the community now is that people have, have now designed microscopes and commercially uh, all the microscopes are available now with the so-called high definition option. And previously, we used to think that spatial quality was limited to about five microns. Uh, the current thinking is about 0.5 microns. And I'll show you some examples of how that's happening, uh, perhaps in more detail in a little bit. Uh, but essentially, what we, are, what we are grappling with on the physics side is what does uh, the quality mean and how does resolution relate to the quality and so on. And we haven't even talked about yet, uh, as you can see, AI methods uh, to take this physics-based model and perhaps turn it into better uh, AI-equipped models or turn it into better images uh, with AI. So that's a huge opportunity that we have here to expand uh, pathology, for example. Let's turn back to instrumentation. So what we did was we started building different kinds of instruments based on our learning uh, from here. And uh, this has been an effort that's been ongoing for some time, and I won't belabor this, this is all published. But I just want to share with you the progress that has happened in the field uh, again here. So what we've been able to do is over many years uh, now, starting from this, this first laser-based system in 2012, so you just look at the data on the bottom left uh, here, it was not particularly good, uh, to data that you can see almost on the top right here, uh, which is actually quite state-of-the-art now. We've gone a little bit further than this, uh, but it still remains pretty state-of-the-art. And just to zoom in on a particular number, so. The 2015 data is from a different sample, but the others are essentially the same sample uh, produced in the same manner. And you can see the image quality has dramatically improved uh, in just the last five years. So what this means for AI uh, is that you have much higher spatial detail that can be used, and you have much higher spectral detail, uh, which means the signal to noise ratio of the image is much, much better and much more clear. 
So you would have to spend less time in an AI algorithm to deal with the uncertainties associated with noise. And you can spend more time in mining the data uh, for something that's actually useful. So again, we take this, this graph and we this is some new data that we've come up with this year. And what we did here was uh, adopted a variety of approaches. First, a technique called attenuated total reflection in which we can increase the resolution even further. Uh, then a technique called photothermal optical detection uh, in which we can actually get optical microscopy resolution uh, compared to uh, infrared resolution. And here are some of the latest work in which we actually use an AFM tip and you can get AFM resolution as opposed to optical resolution. So each one of these has a certain advantage and disadvantage and I'll talk about this uh, in a second. Uh, but let's focus our attention a little bit on the middle uh, panel, which is the optical hybrid microscopy that we just came out with this year. And the idea here was to use an infrared excitation uh, that you see uh, denoted by the IR beam and then use uh, an optical detection that you see going on to a CMOS camera. So it brings the best of both worlds. It brings infrared excitation and brings optical microscopy uh, into the picture. Um, what you can see are images that look like this. And this is something that uh, we're quite interested in. Uh, one of the images, the image on the left, is actually a stained image. Uh, it's what, was, what will be used in the clinic. And on the right is an AI interpretation of this uh, IROH data. And so this is an image that is created without using any dyes, without using any labels. And you can see it's uh, pretty close to the image on the left. The slight differences you see are because these are not the same section. This is uh, one section of the tissue and this is a few, uh, maybe about 50 microns away, a different section of the tissue. So they're actually different slices uh, from the same patient in the same field of view. Uh, but regardless, you can actually see uh, some pretty good uh, correspondence between these images. And you can actually uh, see that this image is diagnostically useful. So IR imaging with AI has already come to the point now uh, where we can uh, take images with the data and turn them into clinically interpretable images. Uh, but what we can do is make these much more robust uh, with AI and actually speed up the data acquisition process uh, by demanding less from the physics and turning it more on the computational side. Uh, the advantage that, that we'll always hold is that computing is always cheaper than hardware uh, that, that we will use and we will develop in the lab. So the more we can move on to computing and the more robust we can make our hardware systems with AI algorithms, uh, the more we will be effective. So there is a huge benefit and a huge incentive uh, to, to approach this from an AI perspective uh, after the physics has been optimized to some extent. We're also thinking very closely about taking this even one step further and really trying to get to smaller and smaller volumes where we can increase information content. So in that theme, uh, I'll just summarize what you saw here was a transition from standard definition to high definition. Uh, the high definition IR data remains today uh, the standard to obtain the best quality data spectrally, even though spatially it may not be as, as high. Uh, then I showed you the optical resolution data. This is actually an, a technique that is still emerging uh, but the spatial quality data can be high here. The spectral quality is not as high. And so you all, you have to trade that off in some way. There might be some cases where you can really care about the spatial quality and uh, maybe you can make do with a little less spectral quality. So this might be useful. And in some cases you want to be really subtle. You want to look for really subtle chemical changes in which you need the, you need the HD definition as useful but you really do need the IR data quality. And finally, uh, we have the AFM resolution. Here, you cannot cover a large area because you, know, you have to scan an AFM uh, and that AFM data recording is much slower, but you can get incredible detail. Uh, in principle, you should be able to get down to molecular, single molecule detail uh, with this technique, uh, but AI approaches are needed to make sense of this data because it's noisy, it's small, uh, and the field of view is limited. So how can we expand the field of view and how can we get more resolution? And finally, there's something we've developed theoretically, uh, the so-called super resolution, where in principle, localization of the molecule uh, can happen at the molecular level. Uh, but this would most certainly need AI because uh, this would be a purely computational approach. There are no hardware approaches to actually doing this uh, properly. So again, AI has tremendous opportunities for increasing image quality, 
extracting more information and perhaps making techniques more useful for disease diagnosis and for biology. Here's the kind of data AI is up against. So uh, if you look at uh, the data from that I uh, previously showed you on the different instruments, uh, one end of the data is single cells. And again, even in single cells, we're pushing to subcellular uh, resolution. Uh, the second is cell culture. Can we discover things in cell culture that is involves cell to cell communication, single cell feature changes and so on. Um, the third stop is large numbers of samples, but small samples. So can we look at diverse samples, but just a small snippet of them uh, to, to look at diversity of disease and so on. And finally, the fourth scale is what you see in the surgical sections. We're looking at very large gigapixel scale images uh, that have extensive molecular data and can we make sense of them. So I'll give you some examples from each one of these and point out some of the opportunities uh, for AI. So one of the opportunities for AI is to look at uh, these really fast imaging microscopes that have a limited resolution but can get really good data. And the goal here is to do something like this. So on the top panel in the middle, you see a black and white image uh, that is just a chemical image. And what we want to do is rapidly turn this into a classified image that tells you something about where the disease is. The, the logic for this is that millions of women undergo a mammography every year in the United States alone. And about a million, 1.2 million of them uh, are at suspicion of something suspicion of mammography. And they need to put a needle in and pull some tissue out uh, and look at it and see if there's actually any cancer there or not. So what often happens is the tissue comes out, it is sent to pathology and days and weeks later, uh, you get a decision on whether uh, there was actually any cancer there or not. So what we're suggesting is once the tissue comes out, you just put it on the machine uh, that we built here and you can try and figure out if you can rapidly diagnose cancer there uh, or not. Uh, and then rapidly before the patient gets dressed, tell them uh, we need to plan your next course of action really quickly or there's no cancer, it was just a false alarm, uh, that's okay. And so the goal here is for AI algorithms to rapidly, robustly and very accurately uh, make this decision within a few minutes uh, of the data being acquired. And the data would look into several hundred megapixels uh, per sample. And so you can see here, this is about a gigapixel of data. Uh, and we want the AI algorithm to go through this really quickly, pixel by pixel, and looking at interpixel relationships and tell you uh, uh, very sensitively if this is a, a dangerous cancer or not. So one aspect of it is building an instrument that is fast enough uh, to acquire the data, but the second aspect is to build an online uh, AI uh, workflow that takes the data as it streams in and turns it into, uh, into information. Here's how it would be applied in practice. So on the left, you see a classified image that tells you that there's desmoplastic reaction, which means a, a precancer reaction. There's a, a few spots of cancer on this particular tissue uh, that is denoted in red. And on the right side is the traditional image, and uh, this is something you would like to see. Uh, we want to now translate this to even faster and perhaps do this intraoperatively. So you can see the sample here got much larger. Uh, here, the sample was one, meter, one millimeter in, in width and uh, you know, a few centimeters long. Uh, here, it's a few centimeters by a few centimeters. So we have to acquire the image faster, uh, but you would like to see the, the data essentially come online in real time. Uh, here's what we think will happen in the future in pathology. Uh, you might think of a, a AR or VR system, augmented reality or virtual reality system, where the pathologist is immersed actually in these technologies. And wherever they look at, you can think of an eye tracking system. And wherever the pathologist looks at, uh, it gives out, it pops up information in a little box that tells you uh, exactly what might, be the, uh, what might be the conclusion for that particular part of the tissue. And so this would be real-time AI and very robust AI uh, and thinking about how not only diagnosis is made, uh, but risk is predicted and the risk of being wrong uh, as well as predicted uh, within the AI. So some element of risk analysis and error propagation uh, and its understanding as well uh, would be needed. So let's pick up a challenge now where, which is a really, really subtle uh, you know, advance, and I'll, I'll just explain what this uh, data and perhaps what AI can do. So if you, this is a study published a few years ago and it still remains a sort of gold standard of looking at problems in AI. So what these people did here, uh, this is not our group, this is a, a group out of Boston, 
And what they did was looked at 240 biopsies and looked at how many times different pathologists agreed uh, on the same result. So it turns out uh, unequivocally calling something benign is not actually not that easy. Uh, looking at frank cancer, looking at invasive cancer, uh, actually not that difficult. 96% of the time people agreed on it. Uh, looking at ductal carcinoma in situ, which is a sort of subtle form of, of cancer, uh, was about 84%, which is a little bit less than normal. And looking at atypical formations, which might be early, really early, early uh, signs of cancer or might not be uh, that important at all, uh, the concordance wasn't that high. And obviously you might imagine that these are difficult things to do. Yet in early cancers and in atypical transformations, that's the place where you want to predict something is going on because intervening at that point can be really helpful. Intervening in the point of invasive cancers, of course, can be helpful, uh, but of course, you might understand the cure rates go down uh, the more invasive the cancer becomes. So just to car show you with a cartoon what happens, normal cells are often just in a single line, like you see uh, up on the left, top left. Uh, when you say hyperplasia, that means there's abnormal growth. It just means the cells look kind of normal, uh, but they're, uh, they're growing more than normal. Uh, in the middle, you see what is called dysplasia or atypical hyperplasia. That means uh, not only are cells growing, but they're kind of looking weird uh, morphologically. They might have the potential to harbor cancer. Uh, then you see what is called ductal carcinoma in situ. This means that cancer is localized. It hasn't gone anywhere and it remains confined to the breast and in particular remains confined uh, to the ducts of the breast. And, but you know for a fact that something is not quite right uh, in this case. And finally, you have the invasive tumor uh, where cells have actually escaped where they're supposed to be and they look really, really different and there's many more of them uh, and so on. So ideally, what one would like to do is quite accurately predict dysplasia uh, and ductal carcinoma in situ and separate it from hyperplasia in normal cells and of course recognize uh, malignant and invasive tumors as well because that's something clinicians can do quite well right now. So what we focused our attention on was really using the power of emerging deep learning uh, with the data uh, acquisition that we have and try and see if we can diagnose DCIS uh, and hyperplasia well enough. Uh, and again, you might imagine uh, this, I don't need to explain to this audience, uh, we use deep learning here and it, uh, it's so much more powerful because it includes spatial patterns, it includes heterogeneous data, uh, it includes uh, of course the full power of chemical imaging and we can do multi-scale patterns and, and so on. Uh, but at the end, we try to predict just a few classes of things. And really for this kind of complex problem where you really want to be sure and you want to use all your firepower, uh, we do think deep learning is a really great tool uh, to do this. And we're just beginning on this aspect. So this is an area where we can really work with people uh, and, um, and make some progress. So here's some results. Uh, these are just some initial results unpublished, but I did want to share with this group. And this is just simply amazing. So what deep learning allows us to do is get a really good handle uh, on DCIS, for example. Look how nicely uh, the invasive tumors and DCIS are segregated. And this is, you know, just ignore the small salt and pepper noise because, uh, you know, there are some errors. Uh, but look at the pixel level accuracy, right? Uh, the pixel level accuracies are in the 90s and and upper 90s. And what happens in a tissue is that when, when you look at a tissue, even a small region of it, you sort of tend to ignore the one or 2% noise. And this uh, more than 90%, I would say, uh, pixel level accuracy is more than sufficient uh, to bring us into the clinical domain. So we have uh, been able to obtain initial results uh, that show really good accuracy, but now we need to do this in a larger trial and make sure this works robustly before we can deploy this. And uh, this is really, really exciting. Uh, we have obviously transitioned this to surgical samples and you can see again, uh, they're recognizing DCIS and benign. In the, initial, um, in the initial cohort gave us good results. And now we're doing a, a multi-site trial for this where we're getting samples from different sites and trying to see if we are uh, equally uh, impressive in the results that come out. And if that holds, then of course, we need to do a bigger trial, uh, manage that data, uh, get better AI algorithms and make sure that we're doing state-of-the-art AI uh, and getting the maximum value before we actually start uh, testing on actual multi-site trials and clinical samples here. 
so that's where we are uh, on this uh, on this particular part of the study. Uh, another part of the study that is really interesting, and I think I mentioned this very briefly, is the idea of expanding pathology with molecular detail. So here's some data from, from a few years ago, and actually uh, the University of Illinois owns the patent to this, our group does. Um, and what we did here was we looked at chemical stains. So you see on the left side of this image, you see three different kinds of samples. And uh, in the chemical stained idea, we took multiple sections. So we cut the same tissue many times, uh, we stained them with different dyes, and now you can see, you know, clinically what this looks like. On the right side, uh, we did not stain this tissue at all, and instead we used the spectral data and tried to predict using uh, convoluted neural networks uh, from a few years ago that were less powerful, but try to predict the staining patterns now using light and IR spectroscopy alone. And you can see we did a little bit, um, well, this is standard definition data, this is not high definition data, um, and we can do a, a bit of molecular projection. And in the 2020 work uh, that I also mentioned briefly before, uh, since the spatial quality was much higher, uh, we were able to get really high quality H&E stains. So we did not have the spectral quality to get molecular stains, but we did have the spatial quality uh, to get H&E values quite well. And so now we're at this point where we're trying to implement AI algorithms to get better spatial and spectral data and do things like this. You know, look at really big samples and uh, at will call up high accuracy molecular detail uh, on anywhere. This is a completely uh, uh, stainless image. This is a virtual stain. And in the background, we've done H&E staining, which is the gold standard. And in the foreground, we've put in what we call molecular goggles uh, that we, we can now look at molecular detail uh, on these particular samples. So this is quite exciting, and uh, we hope as the spatial and spectral qualities go up, uh, and we will bring in more and more powerful AI approaches so that we can do this fast and do this with greatly expanding the molecular palette of pathology than it has ever been uh, before. Uh, here's one example of what we're doing. We have data now on these uh, myriad uh, you know, stains, and we're trying to turn these all into uh, IR-determined stains. So we've gone with these um, eight stains to begin with, and they're all prognostically useful. Uh, there's some utility in looking at all these stains, and we're going to explore these uh, to begin with. Here's some initial results. Uh, what we can do with these stains uh, is actually look at two different kinds of receptors. So these are, again, unpublished data that I would like to share with you. Uh, but where uh, clinically ER status is uh, negative, for example, the IR data predicts that it's negative, and where it's high, it predicts it's high, and so on. So uh, what we can do with these, uh, if, we, if these results hold up, is without uh, actually using uh, hundreds of dollars of stains, uh, we can generate the same data, and we can generate it rapidly, we can generate it at the point of care, and we can generate it in an interactive way. Uh, that is uh, the power of AI. So we're hoping to head down this, this path with, with more uh, powerful uh, data. Again, notice that we're only able to do this on a small size of sample, but we would like to do this on surgical samples. So we need the, the hardware uh, and of course, uh, perhaps advances um, in, in data uh, handling and data and AI approaches that allow us to do this with more sparse data uh, and certainly uh, do this faster. So that's the, the challenge in, in uh, AI that we're facing at this point. Uh, let me get more explicit on some of those challenges and I'll, I'll uh, get, provide you some numbers on the challenges for AI uh, that this field poses. And again, uh, happy to discuss any aspect of this. Uh, one, uh, as you might have guessed by now, is that the challenge of large data. So we, have, we need actually to look at the heterogeneity of cancer, hundreds of samples typically. Uh, we need those samples, uh, again, if we go and measure them with small samples like we've done with tissue microarrays, then you get large numbers of patients, but a smaller sample per patient. Uh, the other uh, uh, technique that we've undertaken now is actually to look at surgical samples. So here also you can get hundreds of samples, but each sample now has gigapixels of image. So you're looking at terabytes of, of data per sample, and you're looking at large numbers of samples. So this is technologically feasible, uh, but how do you do deep learning on these in an efficient manner? Uh, the second is dealing with heterogeneity. So here's a really great example of how uh, heterogeneous a tumor might be. 
Uh, and just if you look at the color coded image in the blue and red and, and uh, black in the bottom, you're seeing different kinds of things being coded there. And this is by no means the extent of the information, right? Uh, we can add in many more categories to this and now you'll have a 15 color image, for example. So on one hand, uh, we can have spatially uh, heterogeneity and spectrally heterogeneity, uh, both from the biology as well as from organization, but we also have heterogeneity from noise and other factors. And the, the difference between data is quite little. So what you're seeing between the spectral and spatial heterogeneity is something that no good uh, algorithms exist yet to even understand, uh, leave alone, deal with, or utilize in an effective way uh, in AI. Uh, the third challenge is that for everything we do, we have handcrafted workflows right now. Uh, this is really great if you're starting to build out a new uh, workflow, for example, trying to put everything into deep learning in one integrated workflow. Uh, but right now we have, um, the good part is that we have validated all of this carefully uh, by hand uh, uh, crafted uh, you know, features and by hand crafted workflows, uh, but certainly uh, there's a lot of room to optimize and, and automate all of this and, and really turn it into a workflow that can be adopted uh, for many different kinds of problems quite rapidly. So one of our major bottlenecks is this handcrafting of workflows and features that, that goes on. Uh, finally, just related to that is this idea of feature engineering or discovery or annotation. These are all manual processes right now. And there are really some interesting and exciting sort of AI challenging um, uh, you know, concepts here that would challenge on how you do weekly supervised learning, for example, or how you would discover new features, both spatial and spectral, and perhaps uh, convoluted spatial and spectral features uh, that might be helpful. So this is yet another challenge. So these four challenges, I think, are really fundamental to not only moving this technology forward, but they're also fundamental to many AI approaches that are emerging now. And again, if you're interested in, uh, from the point of view of as an AI scientist, or from a pathology point of view, or from a spectroscopy point of view, these are really, really rich problems uh, that you can get engaged with. So I'll just quickly conclude and then uh, maybe hopefully we can have a good discussion. Um, I think the, the lessons I want to leave you with is that if we want to expand pathology uh, between what we can do today, uh, then we will need measurement technology. And I think we have a really great measurement technology uh, in our hands right now. What we need to do is build even better AI technology that can not only provide a means to interpret the data, but expand the, uh, the information palette that we have. Uh, the challenges today really lie in developing great tr translational workflows and perhaps discovering things uh, that we didn't know uh, from the data. And finally, there are tremendous challenges uh, for AI. The data is heterogeneous. It needs to be federated. I didn't even talk about this uh, a little bit. Uh, but there are enormous challenges associated with storage, with retrieval, uh, with dealing with gold standards. How do you validate this? Hosting data, uh, data and algorithms uh, and accessibility of these large data sets uh, to a wider audience uh, and certainly to the AI community. So we're, we're really delighted and happy to work with the community on this. Uh, and I look forward to a discussion. Uh, before that, I want to thank our sponsors and really point out several folks in my lab who've done a uh, bulk of the work here. So one is Kia, who many of you know, and the other is Shachi Mittal, uh, who many people here know as well. Uh, but I look forward to, to your comments and, and discussions. So with that, I'll stop here and happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Yeah, are there any questions? Maybe I can get started. Actually, um, as I was listening to this presentation, I was thinking, what sort of, uh, advan of advances in AI you would like to see to be helpful? Yeah, I think that that's a great point. So I, uh, you know, one of the, one of the keys is, is this fold, right? So uh, how can we very efficiently deal with, uh, you know, these questions, right? Um, and at the end of the day, it really comes about how we can include pathology information, maybe some of the physics of the imaging information uh, to make powerful AI algorithms. But uh, the bottom line is we are really interested in these kind of problems, right? How do we address uh, this problem? So I'll, I'll give you one problem, for example. Uh, how do we build an AI algorithm uh, that takes data intraoperatively from breast cancer patients and provides receptor status as well as disease diagnosis, right? In a very robust manner uh, that stands the, 
uh, the test of you know, going across clinical settings and building the algorithms uh, that can be validated for hundreds of patients, uh, right? So uh, that's, that's the challenge. And of course, there are many subplots to this, right? Uh, one is how would that algorithm improve over time uh, you know, with, with learning and with more data? Uh, how would that algorithm improve over time uh, with new biological knowledge that might be discovered uh, and so on? So I think we're at the really early stages uh, of AI and pathology, uh, especially when you start to include heterogeneous data like this. So, so you know, it's, it's really wide open, right? We, we just need to start somewhere and, uh, and slowly build up value uh, in that area. All right, um, any other questions? So maybe you can describe what's current, what is sort of current state of the art in terms of you know, availability of these data sets and availability of um, a label of data sets that one can use? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you're, if you're not in our lab, you don't have access uh, to these data sets. Oh, that's not fun. Uh, not fun. You know, yeah. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's part of the conversation we were having uh, the other day. I think um, the lack of availability, you know, we have, we have several petabytes of data uh, that is annotated and that, is, that could potentially be made available. Uh, to people, but it's it's just not available because it's. Sorry, let me get the. Uh, the lovely, sorry about that. The lovely sun out of the, um, of the picture here. But uh, we would love to have this be available because that could drive a lot of uh, a lot of innovation here, and uh, it's just not available uh, right now. But for researchers on our campus, we can. Uh, you know, anyone who wants to work with us and. Uh, part of your subplot would be to, to use this data and make your experiences available. Uh, we're very happy to, to work with you. All right, so any other questions? I have one question. So sure. in, in terms of uh, the areas that are right now most exciting in cancer research for applications of AI, uh, Rohit, uh, and talking about you know the broader community, what would be some major milestones that uh, you will be trying to accomplish within the next few years? Yeah, that's a great question, Ilu. I think um, uh, so. Let's divide uh, this thought process into a couple of bins. So on one side is sort of the genomics community and the drug development community, and the idea there is to very precisely figure out the origins of cancer so you can build drugs against it, right? And um, you know, the, the main challenge there is to figure out the correct subtypes of cancer uh, that allow you to build, uh, that allow you to predict whether a particular drug would be effective or not. And so that's one community, that's not us, we're not approaching that problem here. Uh, a second community is to figure out how we can use AI and really transform the practice of pathology so that we can get better diagnoses in shorter time with fewer resources, uh, right? And that's, uh, that's a large thrust of what you saw in my talk here. And the milestone there would be to get uh, AI approved algorithms into the clinic. You're already seeing some success there where, uh, for example, there's now an FDA approved AI approach uh, to automatically score slides for KI67, which is one marker. Uh, so currently there are three, uh, to my knowledge, there are three uh, FDA approved uh, AI softwares uh, that do this, right? They look at one marker and they, they try to make it objective uh, so that it can be used in the clinic. Uh, a third area is really research oriented, which is, okay, so you have all this data and we have, uh, you know, some level of data, other people have other data uh, that goes with this, right? So uh, what will, how do we guide research with this data? So data-driven discovery, uh, I think would be um, uh, a third area. And a major milestone would be if the data told you, uh, look at these four subtypes and then look at their genomic basis or look at these different cell types and how they interact. Uh, and some new knowledge came out of that, uh, that would be useful, right? So I think those are the milestones that uh, in each one of these areas would be, would be key. And uh, just to uh, round this up, uh, in what area uh, do you think Illinois as a whole is leading in the community? Like what, what are the main areas of expertise that we have and that we could support, for example, through the center? 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the genomics part, Ilu, I think is honestly, it's quite gone, right? There are there are places like the Broad Institute, for example, that have years and years of experience at this and are doing this. Um, uh, the clinical, the places that require a huge clinical image, uh, I don't think we are competitive because, they, you know, if, if you wanted to have access to 100,000 patients' data, uh, we needed to have started our med school, you know, uh, a century ago, right? Um, so where we can be really successful, I think, is this merger of new technology leading to new insight, right? Where we are the technology leaders uh, in the world. For example, you know, in mass spectrometric imaging, right? Uh, in this kind of optical imaging that I showed you today. Uh, and this is data that no one else has. Uh, it's a place where genomics and, and uh, other things are very complementary uh, to what we do. And so I think we utilize our expertise uh, in physical imaging, uh, along with our expertise on uh, handling extremely large data sets uh, and uh, being able to, to work with those, right? So for example, by the time all is said and done, a good pathology data set with heterogeneous information and so on uh, might run into 10 petabytes or, or something, right? So the computing people who can handle 10 petabytes uh, you know, routinely for many groups across the country are very limited. And, and NCSA is obviously one of those places where uh, we can make that happen. So I think for heterogeneous data, for large volume data, uh, we can still be the place that, that does that. Uh, but again, there's, you know, people are emerging. You know, Broad Institute has an effort now launched uh, on the image analysis part uh, where they're looking at just optical microscopy images, uh, right, and, and trying, to, trying to do better with those. So again, uh, we have to move fast, I think, in this area, but, but we do have an advantage that no one else does. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I would like to thank you, Rohit, for your um, very insightful presentation, and uh, hopefully this gave some ideas for attendees to see what they can uh, do to help with this, uh, with advancing this project. Sure. Thank you very much, we appreciate your, your presentation very much. Thank you, Vlad, thank you uh, for having me here.